Japan has become the fifth country to land on the moon after a craft uh, dubbed Moon Sniper touched down on the lunar surface. The land of the rising sun has now too conquered the moon. Japan just became the fifth country in history to land on the lunar surface, following the USA, late Soviet Union, China, and India. On January 19th, the Japanese Space Agency announced the successful touchdown of a robotic lander, following a tense one-engine landing that nearly resulted in the loss of the craft. Japan has now joined an exclusive list of countries that have accomplished what was once viewed as impossible, a list that is rapidly growing. Not only did India land on the lunar south pole as early as fall of 2023, but a long string of international commercial companies have been in a race to do the same. All of this within a startlingly short time frame, compared to the half century that has been since America performed its last crude landing. Suddenly, the moon is attracting the attention of governments and companies around the world. And we are just at the start of what's going to amount to a new space race, with significant implications for the people on Earth. Let's talk about why that's important and what it means for Japan and the world at large. But before we get into that, if you're hungry for keeping up with all the exciting developments in the new space economy, from where the money is flowing to the latest news, don't hesitate to subscribe to my free space industry newsletter, Launchpad, landing in your inbox once per week. Now, back to business. I'm in Tokyo, the eastern capital of the world's fourth largest economy and one of the most technologically ambitious countries on the planet. Robotics, material science, high-end electronics, all of these are not only important aspects of the Japanese economy, but ingrained in their very culture. Japan has a long history of pursuing ambitious technical projects, and space is no exception, even though they aren't perfect, of course. To give you an idea, one of Japan's top construction companies wants to start building a real space elevator in 2025, which I've made a video on and linked below if you're interested in learning more. But that ambition has carried on to the Japanese Space Agency, or JAXA, their version of NASA. I got to tour their whole facility in Scuba, Japan, along with my dad, a NASA astronaut there for training. And it was impressive. Japan has had their eyes on the moon for a while now. In fact, this technically isn't the country's first landing attempt. In early 2023, Japanese space technology startup iSpace not only nearly secured the win for Japan, but would have been the first private company to land on the moon as well. Ever. An amazing attempt, but ultimately doomed to failure, as the crew lost contact with the probe and it was believed to have crashed on the moon. Naturally, there was a lot of pressure to see this JAXA robot nail the landing. Called SLIM, short for Smart Lander Investigating Moon, this lander carried multiple small rovers that were deployed to explore the surface in extreme detail. One of these probes is literally just a ball that rolls around, designed to take measurements of the regolith and better understand robotic mobility in a low-gravity environment. One of them took a picture of the lander here, showing that it did indeed land upside down. The spacecraft landed in Shioli Crater, a large impact left behind by an ancient asteroid strike. And while the probes themselves seem small, the data they gather will be useful and the precedents that they set cannot be understated. Japan has come swinging hard into a new space race between America and its allies and China and its allies. Both groups are in a tangled competition in everything from satellite constellations and space stations to near-future ventures like asteroid mining and, of course, off-world colonies. But if there's one thing that all of this makes clear, it's that space is no longer just the final frontier. It's now the new gold rush. Entire countries and international companies alike look to the moon and don't just see an inspiring object, but an investment in their own national security and a voice at the table. The moon is an untapped world, and just like the new world of the Americas, where the cultural, financial, and social impact of its original colonial settlers still shows its influence, whoever controls the moon first gets to write the rules, and now Japan is one of them. America and its allies have drafted the Artemis Accords, of which Japan is a signing member, promising to the safe exploration of the moon. 36 countries across the world, from developing nations interested in sending their first payloads to space, to geopolitical powerhouses like India and Japan, have all thrown their lot behind NASA and its Artemis program. Meanwhile, countries like China have rejected these accords as the neo-colonialism of space and drafted their own competing pact with Russia, Venezuela, Pakistan, and Belarus, none of which are very Western-friendly countries. And looking at this from the outside in, it almost seems like a new space race. Except instead of being spearheaded by the two bipolar superpowers of the world, this global-spanning competition seems reflective of our increasingly multipolar world, where different concentrated regions compete for the benefit of themselves and their ideological partners. But this might not necessarily be a bad thing. The competition is ambitious. 
Both parties aim to create their own separate lunar bases, and while space relations tend to be professional, with America and Russia's multi-decade partnership on the ISS being a prime example, there's no telling how these competing parties might treat each other on something as important as carving out a chunk of the moon for control over its resources, exploration, and general access. After all, we humans still have relatively trivial disputes even today. Even over land designated for international research like Antarctica, which seems big enough for everyone, right? Tell that to world governments. Why would the moon, with its uncountable, untapped resources, be any different? Companies want in on this action too, which is why in America alone, six separate companies are trying to privately land payload on the moon over the remainder of the decade. Everything from the massive SpaceX Starship and Blue Origin landers to the smaller robotic Odysseus lander from Intuitive Machines, which was successful. All of them looking to ferry payload, harvest ice into liquid water for rocket fuel, or survey the ground for future mining spots. And that's to say nothing of the international companies as well. The moon has vast quantities of hydrogen and oxygen, which can be used to generate rocket fuel on site, alongside some rare earth elements like beryllium and lithium. And of course, the coveted helium-3 isotope, long fabled to be the secret sauce for unlimited, clean fusion energy. Any of these resources, if utilized, will allow their users to expand their accomplishments even further. Refined rocket fuel can go on to power exploration to Mars and the geopolitical winds that that would bring. Off-world elements could create new interplanetary supply chains for some of Earth's most critical and contested materials, and if anyone can crack fusion with Helium-3, well, they deserve a video all their own. But all this is to say that these missions aren't just expendable political wins done to say that they were. All these countries and companies are racing to the moon because they view it as an investment in their future control over everything from cutting-edge space research to resource supply chains, all of which could have profound impacts on the lives of countless people on Earth because they view the taxpayer funding or commercial loans and contracts as worth the cost. Japan will not be the last. More countries and companies will follow over the coming years in an exponential flood breaking new records each year. It wasn't that long ago when the number of launches in a single year numbered in the dozens, and now SpaceX alone has nearly breached 100 in 2023. Space exploration is beginning to become commoditized, routine, but certainly not boring, and the moon will follow the same fate, first with robots and soon with people. While NASA hasn't landed anything on the moon since the 1970s, the Artemis program is about to change that, aiming to return humans to the moon on the lunar south pole by 2026 and achieve sustainable lunar exploration by the late 2020s. While it's easy to criticize the slow progress compared to the rate that other countries have been landing on the moon, it's not like NASA isn't making giant strides in space exploration. Over the decades, NASA has landed more rovers on Mars than what India and China have landed on the moon combined. And with the International Space Station slated to be retired in 2031, which I'm making a video on soon by the way, NASA will soon have a lot more time and funding on its plate to devote to the moon. But the future is uncertain. While it's easy to think that the future is always going to be an upward line of progress, that trend isn't guaranteed. There's even historical examples of the opposite. The cancellation of the American Space Shuttle program in 2011 also came with a plethora of major budget cuts for NASA that gutted the Constellation program, which was the major push to return to the moon at the time, and primarily Mars as well. Limited manufacturing of the rockets for this program had already even started, Mars was once again pushed into the ambiguous near-term future. My father Don joined the astronaut corps in 1997, where he's still active to this day. But even he has a bitterly amusing story of being enthusiastically told by his managers that his class of astronauts would have been the first to visit Mars. That was almost 30 years ago. Mars has a sordid reputation of always being 20 to 30 years in the future. And the moon may suffer the same fate. And internal budget cuts are just the tip of the iceberg. External disruptions to the status quo could also put these bold plans to return to the moon and Mars at risk once again. A Chinese invasion of Taiwan, another deadlier pandemic, or just the gradual loss of interest in space is a very real threat. And once again, there is historical precedence. In the 1970s, the Apollo program was abruptly cut, with Congress refusing to give NASA the funding needed to produce the massive Saturn Vs that were required to reach the moon, instead re that funding for the Vietnam War. And keep in mind that this was at the height of the Cold War and the tail end of the space race, when politics very much dictated space as a cultural and national security issue. If it happened once, it could happen again. The Artemis program has already been delayed multiple times, as recently as this year, pushing the first crewed mission around the moon to 2025 and the first lander to 2026. And the longer these delays pile on, the tighter the spending becomes and the less happy Congress 
comes with funding it. Will Artemis or future Mars missions be cancelled? It's difficult to say, but one thing is certain. With an international push to return to the moon, new competition between rivals that brings back some of the geopolitical motivation from the Apollo era, and the rapid growth of private industry helping push boundaries that governments can't is looking optimistic. No one wants a repeat of the past, especially when the future looks so bright and so very profitable. And so this new landing by Japan, cementing their place in history, is just the beginning. And either way, you won't want to miss that exciting new race soon to come. Follow to stay in the loop.